I'll start with the three questions, though, because I always oh, yeah. like to encourage the men to do that. So um, this, uh, these three, the, the three fundamental questions, remember what they are, and I'm hoping that uh, I'm trying to encourage everyone to uh, to use those uh, on a regular basis. What do you seek right now? What are you looking for in life? Uh, what do you uh, hope for? What's your aspiration? What do you desire? What's your longing? And that is a thing that um, a man needs to get into touch with more fully and completely uh, than uh, most ever do. Uh, and then, of course, this question, who do you say that I am? And what I now have done is a little, a, a, a little visual that I can use to, to actually uh, populate that idea of who do you say that I am? So I, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but it's um, easy to find, but... Um, or I could send it to you, but it's a nice, nice way of kind of filling in what is it, what does the scripture say he is? And so you could just select any of these images here. They're all biblical pictures of who he is. So you could have, uh, for example, he is my, uh, our hope, he's the, the physician, he is the prince, he is the, uh, the elect, he's the seed of David, he is the messenger of the covenant, he's the foundation, he's the forerunner. He's a, you just randomly pick these phrases and it's really a very nice way of doing it, isn't it you just see he's god manifest in the flesh he's the bright and morning star the angel of the lord the, um, the first and the last the bridegroom the commander so what i like about this is that it uh, gives us and guides us with biblical visions and images of who jesus is that populates this question of who do you say that i am and that's what I, I really would uh, want to do. So, Dennis, I can provide that image for you. You we can, and you can share it with the guys if, um, because I found that to be very useful. Um, yes. When, okay. Yes, it, it would be a very good thing to do. And it, when I when I then think of this third question, do you love me more than these? <laughs> one of the things that I can use for that is my my uh, nine P's image here because I have often used uh, the the nine uh these these basically um uh, nine images here of the idols for destruction and the variations of in men's hearts these nine um areas and everybody is pulled to some degree by each of them but in varying ways i've, I've as i've come to see it and i'm i'm reviewing something this for some of you this is maybe new but for some of them you've already seen it but um it's as peter says i'm stirring up your sincere heart by way of reminder and so if you look at these then what i i realized is that let's say person blue the blue this person in, in, in it, it symbolized by the blue uh, numbers that would be perhaps his flesh pattern more or less uh he's drawn more to pleasure than he is to position as you can see pleasure is a big deal to him position isn't as much whereas another person could be very different um uh, like, like this person in um red may be more drawn uh toward prestige than to performance but this person in black is more drawn to performance than to prestige so I don't think any two people really have the same flesh signature. Everyone uniquely manifests a distorted image of God because each one of us is called to actually display and manifest a uh, unique image of him. In other words, we have a spirit signature that I now describe it as, a, a spirit signature that means that each of us is meant to display and manifest the life of Christ in a way that no one else can uniquely do. And we, each of us has a, has a unique uh, capacity to do that. And then it occurred to me, having spoken a lot about this idea of a flesh signature, that actually the flesh signature is that the distorted image of the, of the true self. And so it would make complete sense that there'd be a wide array of possibilities here with these. But in all instances, though, one can be confident that not a one of these will achieve love, joy, and peace. Not a one of them. And then if I fill out more the fullness of the uh, fruit of the Spirit, we see a quality of a person who manifests the fruit of the Spirit. But again, through the unique prism of a personality that no one else quite has. 
So it's a very important thing, I think, for people to realize that uh, we are called in unique ways uh, to manifest the life of Christ in a way that no one else can quite do. And so I, I, I describe it as um, a way of, of living and of, of being that um, really helps us to understand that we're looking at a, not a kind of a shadow, but a distorted, a dark side, uh, this, this whole idea of um, our flesh signatures, as I say, they're kind of shadow our spirit signatures, but the biblical metaphor is darkness uh, rather than shadow. And darkness and cold, as you well know, um, darkness and cold are not things in themselves, are they? Uh, darkness, as we know, is uh, the absence of light, and uh, cold is the absence of heat. They're not a thing, a state, any more than sin uh, than, than evil is. Evil, you see, is an onto, I call it an ontological parasite. Uh, what I mean is a parasite on good, or it's a parasite on truth. It's a parasite on beauty. And so the distortion of evil, Satan cannot create any kind of new pleasure. He can only distort the pleasures that God himself has made and invite, the, invite people to um, use them. And uh, he doesn't care which combination it is. It's indifferent to him. But the point is, evil is not a, a thing itself, but it's a distorted goods and disordered loves. So think of it that way. Think of it as um, dis distorted goods and disordered loves. And that's that's a nice way of, of understanding of, uh, I think, the nature of our condition in this world. So if this is true, then if you look at the person who is walking in the spirit, and when as you walk by the spirit, you put away the deeds of the flesh, so that all of us have the same opportunity and the option and the access to the power of God in a way that's really person specific and situation specific and so we're called to manifest the love of christ uh, the joy the peace patience kindness but unique through our personality and so we're i think called more and more to become uh, more transparent uh, more uh, av available and um, more um, of christ in us and so he increases as we decrease but it's not that you lose yourself, but actually you find your true self in losing the false self, if I'm making any sense there. So I just wanted to, that's just something I wanted to run by, because to me, this is a huge thing. We long for and, la and desire too little, is the point. So when, when we go to this concept here of uh, what do I seek then, and, and I ask myself, what am I looking for? Well, I realize, do you love me more than these? If I love them more than these false goods, if I if if my my love is ordered, not disordered, if it's if it's uh, something that is um, the um, these these things that I'm pursuing are real goods that God has called me to pursue because they are His, they are following hard after Him. And then the other thing I wanted to mention again is by way of reminder that you can remember just by saying, uh, so in, remember it's John 1 and John 21. It's uh, They're bookended in so far as only the, the first and third are only found in John's gospel, which, which has material that is not found in the synoptics. And so the very first question, the very last question, and then I even say, what, who do? <laughs> so what, who do, if you want to remember it, uh, what the sequence is in that respect. So um, I just wanted to throw that in. And then, of course, this other component that I always invite you to include after using that or before is uh, trusting the Father, abiding in the Son, and walking by the Spirit and, and what that looks like at, um, as well. So let's stop and uh, see. Does that make sense? Or any, let's see if we have questions on that, and then we'll move on from there. I just what I was felt, I was prompted just to share that with you. In other words, longing longing for more than the world would invite us to pursue. Men sell themselves too cheaply, and um, along that very line, if you grasp your identity in Christ, and this is um, again the whole concept of. Who are, who are you really? And if I use a list, and this, these are all taken from chapter three of Conform to His Image. But if I see myself 
as God sees me, or or renew my mind to see him as he as such, that I am indeed a child of God, that I'm a friend of, of Jesus, that my old self was crucified, I'm no longer a slave to sin. And remember what I mean by this affirmation of these truths, that you choose to believe that they are true in spite of your feelings and circumstances to the contrary. Now, that's very critical that you must choose to say, I'm going to reckon it as true that you say I'm dead to sin, and and so I'm going to regard it as true, even though it doesn't comport with my feelings and experiences that often have been to the contrary because of the conditional um, love that I may have experienced, the performance-based acceptance I may have experienced, any number of false things that then can uh, can really imprint, a false imprint on us. We um, do not see ourselves as God sees us when that occurs. But Instead, if we choose to believe these things, even though we don't feel that way, I believe that by making that volitional choice, they will, by practice and habituation, become more true of us than uh, had they, they would have been in the past. They can a very, very gradual growth in this, um, so that we could say that I've been accepted by Christ. And there are some people, though, who might filter that out. And they might filter it out because they might say, maybe someone else has been accepted, but I don't feel accepted. I've never have been. And so we can we can filter uh, these 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 ideas. And I I call them cultural, theological, and emotional filters. I suppose there's even a volitional filter, but we can easily tune out the truths that we read in the scriptures that tell us about ourselves. Because either a cultural or a theological, and or say it's an emotional filter where you never really felt uh, unconditional love from your, your father, it might be very difficult then for you to to affirm with the scriptures that in fact you are accepted in Christ, so that your experience in this world will mitigate against and 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 and, and war against the truths of the scriptures. And the way you overcome falsehood is always um, by not trying to get rid of falsehood and error, but by never trying to avoid what you don't want, but rather by pursuing what you do want. So the wise person would then pursue the things that will um, be positive and, and whatever is true and right and honorable, that I would fix my mind on that. And so as I choose to do this, my view is that the more I embrace these as, as true, in spite of my feelings and experiences, I think that gradually they do become more true because we accept them. And the spirit can, uh, as we create the conditions for growth, it's it's like a greenhouse. Um, we, we can actually create a condition in which we begin to buy into these truths. And if I truly believe that I'm, look at this last one, chosen of God, holy and beloved, that can have an enormous impact on my security. In fact, uh, this identity is one of the great motivators because one of the things that I can use when I'm tempted is to say, that's not who I am. You see, that is beneath the dignity of the person you and I have been called to be. Sin is beneath your, your, your true uh, 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 dignity in Christ. And so I have found that if I use identity as a motivator that way, um, that this is not who I am, and there's no future in it, and um, I am more than that. I'm not defined by those things that pull uh, others, but rather I'm defined by the one who made me. Then that makes more sense than to see that these things are ways in which we can view ourselves, but you know as well that they need to be reviewed again and again. Uh, we just need to uh, understand what that looks like. So that's that. I just felt prompted to share some of those thoughts with you uh, to kick us off this morning. Is there a specific uh, question that, that we have that someone would like us to zoom in on, or a um, particular thing, perhaps something that we've been um, talking about in the just the series that we've been doing um, in the prison epistles, or it could be anything that you want. You know, can can I got one for you? Um, you know, just what you just talked about, 
in some areas can be a struggle. For example, if you had, you mentioned if you had a bad relationship with your father, then that creates certain dynamics in your life. You know, I had very bad situations with both my dad, my natural dad and my stepdad. And so I have a hard time praying when I'm praying, believing that God um, would really want to bless me. And I had, I remember there's a quote that I read every day by Brownlow North. He was a British, uh, a British bishop where he says, you know, you say that you pray, but when you kneel down, do you really believe Jesus kneeling next to you desiring to bless you? And I look at it like, well, you didn't really bless me with that dad and you didn't bless me with that dad. So do you really, really care? Do you, do you follow me there? Yeah. And, I, and even today at 72, I still struggle with that dynamic. Like, God, do you really give a rip? And I'm not, yeah. I don't mean to be sad, say the way I say that, but no, I find no. myself having to overcome my own thinking because I said, you've been given 72 years that made me feel like I was blessed. I haven't, we haven't gotten there yet in some way. Yes. Do you follow me? Yeah. And I I, follow. it sounds like I'm, anyway. No, I, I do follow you, uh, Chuck. But I make you're you're making complete sense because all of us are in a story, um, as you know the uh, the the, uh, uh, the the this the story of uh, four acts, and with that that second act of the fall, we are still in, are immersed in this fallen world, and though um, he is now uh, overcoming gradually these blast the blast of the fall. And in Christ, the alienation um, against God has been overcome. But then that second alienation within ourselves is, an, is a process of application. And the third alienation with others is going to be also affected by the fact that we are called to love God completely, ourselves correctly, and others compassionately. And so, but we cannot do love others as well, well if we... Um, still are wrestling with those things yet we do wrestle and so i think a brutal realism is to say that we are in in fact a fallen world and so it is and the flesh furthermore that internal uh battlefront can never be um removed in this life you never can get rid of the flesh signature you can't get rid of uh it can't be removed and you sure can't improve it so the only thing you can do then is by 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 training and by habituation. In my view, you can become more adept at using the truth, the, the 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 things of the spirit, to become more definitive of your of your nature, so that you begin to realize that you are called to have a uh, a life of uh, of great vitality because you're walking in the power of the spirit, and so. It's, it, but it's, it really has to do with this idea of, um, of not train, not trying, but training. Let me see if I can, um, let me see if I can find it here. Yes, it's, it's this whole, whole idea of, I think it's, 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 um, it's not trying to, and surely never, never try to clean up your flesh. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> but instead, train yourself to walk by the spirit. Because therein lies the choice in Romans 7, walk by the Spirit. And the training that's involved with that is a habituated practice, whereby every time I become conscious of this downward pull of the flesh, that sent that gnawing feeling of inadequacy, that's, that's a, a, a wound that was burned into me so that it was um, you almost branded or imprinted with that wound. In my view, the only way of overcoming that is to walk in the spirit. And when I walk in the spirit, I overcome the deeds of the flesh, not by my effort, but by his grace. But my side of the coin, though, is training. And so, as you know, grace is not, is, effort is not opposed to grace. Earning is. So effort is actually a strong biblical vision, and that's always involved in the practice of obedience. Because if you want to know him, you're going to do what he calls you to do. And the better you, the more you obey, the better you'll know him, because it's a portal of divine disclosure. So if I'm called then to say, to wallow, I don't, I'm not called to wallow in um, self-pity or self-distorted images, but rather to set my mind on the things above where Christ is, 
and to realize that I'm seated with him in the heavenlies and that my true self, my real self, is actually um, in him and he in me, then that becomes a training exercise in which through that endeavor and whatever means I use to renew my mind, that it becomes more real in my experience and I become more spring-loaded, and that's the phrase you hear, heard me use a lot, you become more spring-loaded to the spirit, walking by the spirit, and and therefore less, you're, walking by the flesh becomes no longer a default modality, but it becomes a distorted thing, and you begin to realize that's not who I am, that's beneath my dignity. Um, I had an experience I'll, I'll share just yesterday when I was, um, uh, it was Wednesday actually, and uh, I was, I, I spoke at um, Petrie Hill's place and it was a very interesting audience. Indeed, uh, these are, uh, it was a very um, high-end uh, senior uh, living center. And a lot of these people were people who may have had a, some Christian base, but it was often it was would be a workspace thing or something like that. But it was a fascinating audience for me to pro process with them and to, to think about uh, meaning, identity, purpose, and hope. When we went to breakfast um, afterwards, um, we um, had a I, I had an interesting experience in this particular restaurant. There is filled with pictures, and uh, there was one picture. That the other that I'm facing the direction, and my two friends are in another direction. That I see in front of me, off in the wall, and I realize this isn't something I need to be looking at. It was particularly appealing to my flesh. So immediately, um, I'm having to choose to say, "This is not um, a, someone to be a, a people or a woman is not to be treated as an object." But as a subject, uh, the glory of God, a bearer of the God, image of God. So I say that's not who I am, and I realize that a man. When you have, if you've ever seen a guy ogling a woman, it's not a pretty sight. Why would I want to be that way? That's not who I am. So in that, in other words, this grasp of identity becomes a very ex powerful experiential understanding. This is who you are, now walk in it. But you have the resources because God never calls us to do a thing that he doesn't empower us to achieve. So he gives you the power to do what he calls you to do. And this is why he tells us, his, his, because his commands um, are, are not burdensome, as John puts it. So if we see it that way, I think you begin to train yourself. And then the other part was the, not time, but intention. After, after what I mean by that is what do you want? And I'm right back to this fundamental question here that we were asking before. And it's this, it's this question of what do you seek? So what is my intention? And so in my intention, it's, but it's when I say not time, but intention, I'm saying that at any time, you can practice his presence and become increasingly aware and skillful as well through that training of being understanding that that the uh, that this day you got your plans your chronos god has his kairos his interruptions his invitations and you can train yourself to be on the lookout and the more you do that the more but it's but it's it's a matter of intentionality of what you want not a matter of time when i so when we speak about walking by the spirit is that something that you do in the morning and not in the evening when you think about loving your neighbor is that you do i'll just do that in the afternoon if you think about rejoice always pray without ceasing and everything give thanks those are ongoing practices when you think about Walk by the Spirit, uh, abide in Christ is another metaphor, another image. You don't just abide in Christ uh, before you go to bed or when you get up, you do it through the day. And this taking this, this practice of his presence seriously means that um, it's what do I intend at this moment, in this hour, in this, in this minute to do. And then, live, and then Matt seeking to live on two levels simultaneously to train yourself to be aware that you are a spiritual being having this earthbound embodied experience. 
Ken, can you hear me? Yes. Art, Art Farrington. Hey, Art. How are you? Good. I see you with your uh, your your headphones there. That's me. That's hey, you. Uh, <clears throat> the key really is training. How do I know that? Well, I'm a fighter pilot. Mm. And you fight the way you train. Hmm. Period. You know all those little kids that got killed in Texas until somebody showed up that was trained to do the right thing? Boom, it was over. Yeah, you're right. Those guys and gals standing around were doing exactly what they were trained to do. It's that simple. Yes. Think about that. That's a very good metaphor, Art. Um, so that your training as a fighter pilot, your training um, really created or prepared the way for you to have the skills. When the, and that's where discipline come in, by the way. And this is one of the one of the great benefits of the disciplines that Dallas Willard has pointed out. He calls it the law of indirect preparedness. And indirect preparedness means that your training um, or your or your your habituation. Let's say let's use the metaphor of a, of learning a sport. You're training off the playing field, uh, off, off 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 the game, but you're training on the side. Um, right. Or if you're a musician, your practice not in front of an audience, but your it's your regular practice, your habituation, um, whatever it happens to be. That training, that discipline, equips you to have the capacity to do what you need at the point of, of necessity. But you, if you don't train, you don't have that option. Right. You don't, have the, you don't have the freedom. There's a term floating around in the world called gaslighting. Yes, you, there is it. Yeah. Okay. Guess what, nope. gas, guess what gaslighting is? You're hearing, you're, being, you're trained to hear X, Y, and Z. And over time, you actually believe it. That's so right. if you train with the right stuff, you're gaslighting yourself with the right stuff. I mean, it's not a lot to it. So grab on. To, we got the right stuff. It's called the Bible. How can you, how can you go wrong but plugging yourself into that? And, and you're thinking about this film here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. 1944, Charles Boyer, Ingrid Bergman, and Joseph Cotton. And uh, again, that's exactly where, that's where I think the term came from, you see. Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I'm told. Yeah. That's, I, I was uh, alive back then. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing a lot of stuff by that back then. Yeah, that's right. But it's amazing that how, I, how our film becomes an iconic image, isn't it? 1944, yeah. this film, yeah. Ken, I have a question for you regarding yeah. the term spring loaded. Yes. Um, you shared a, uh, an illustration with us when you saw a picture uh, of, uh, I'm assuming, a curvy lady on the, on the wall there. I love that word. You added the word curvy. <laughs> <laughs> well, See, you, okay. you have something in your mind's eye. <laughs> yes, okay. Spring anyway. loaded. Uh, you, that I think is something that would uh, uh, lend itself toward being spring loaded. You know, I see something that's attractive, a female that's attractive, and I've taught myself not to look at her like you say as uh, as an object, but as a creation of God. Uh, how about other types of temptation, though? Let's say that someone has a uh, has a uh, a proclivity toward gossiping mm -hmm. or embellishing uh, that might lead to lying. Yeah. How can, what sort of a red flag? I, I see that picture on the wall as a red flag. So, uh -huh. so what sort of red flags could be brought up, initiated for those types of temptations? I think a brutal honesty about our own flesh signature is going to be a part of it. And uh, to to see what are my patterns in my life? What are the things um, that 
that pull me down and and which which because we all will have that and then to to see what are my patterns and also asking people who know us best and and asking them for the gift of honesty the speaking the truth and love because there're going to be some some things that are we're blind to some things that we do yeah. and there there are times when it, when you didn't even realize you were doing it but when you become aware of it is i think then that becomes a very valuable gift so um there are some things that you can't get away from. it's obvious that you know you're wrestling with something but when you're talking about exaggeration or or any number of things like that that can be more subtle that can it the sins of the spirit can be uh, easily uh missed so i think that's where a brutal honesty is necessary what anyone uh, have some thoughts on that for us um the the concept of um so you if you're using the example of let's say exaggeration or something like that i think it's there are certain kinds of sins that are not as as obvious to us as others and so I, as i see it then it's possible for us to miss certain things because no one perhaps has really uh, caused us to see it in that way um uh and or we haven't invited that uh honesty so there have been times when i have had people who took me aside and say and 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 told spoke the truth and but you want of course to speak the truth in love so um that kind of thing those patterns um are very critical and so that's one of the reasons why I will ask I've asked Karen more than once who I know she this she is the quintessence of my description of the kind of of um the kind of agape that is the steady intention of your will toward another's highest good I know she always has my best interests at heart and if if I am going to be willing to ask her for that gift of honesty what are the things that annoy uh, that are annoying about me to you or what are the things that you think that I don't see i think that that invitation not just your wife but also uh, uh, friends that's where accountability comes in to protect us from ourselves because otherwise i won't even know that i'm doing it so i've had people who rebuked me uh, over the years and faithful of the wounds of a friend but deceit for the kisses of an enemy. And so some have taken me aside and uh told me about things I didn't even know that were as obvious or or evident were maybe clear to me. And then after a while you begin someone tell and then you realize yes it's true. So this uh, this the, some people have a um maybe a flesh signature that includes braggadocio or just subtle uh or, or maybe embellishments let's say it's easy to inflate truth and uh so but I, again each of us has a unique flesh signature no one's quite identical but it's wise i think for us if we want to grow to ask for the gift of um of of perspective so that, of that others will have because others will see things in you that you don't see just as you can see things in them that they may not see and so that's me as, as you're talking here uh, I'm, I'm, it, it's taken on a different dimension, quite frankly. I see that uh, what's the reason behind someone that might embellish or someone that might gossip? Uh, gossiping basically is I know something you don't know. And it will, in, in some ways, in your own mind, make you feel like you're something that you're not. Yeah, you know, I think that's what people do when they are, are bragging. They're trying to convince people that are listening to them uh, of, that there's something that they're not. And so to me, Ken, that can be funneled back down into identity. Who am I? Yep. Who am I? Yeah, it does come down to that. And the more you find your identity in Christ, the more secure you are, and the, and the less you are defined by the opinions and expectations of others, right. which ironically means that you are actually more capable of serving people than you would have been if you were currying favor from them. So when when you are 
um, no longer seeing them as your source of identity or whatever it might be, but you're looking at Christ as your source. That, and remember, people will mediate your needs, but they are not ever the source of your provision. They may be a means by which God can meet our needs for security, significance, and satisfaction, but never ask a person to do what only God can do, because they can never be the source of those things. They can mediate it. Um, but I think that um, when someone cares for you enough uh, that they notice a thing about you that is really um, diminishing to you, your ethos, that you may not even be aware of, Dennis. You see, you, you're, they see something. And if they're prompted by the Spirit to um, just take you aside and ask you, you may not know this, but and I've, I've hate those moments, but I need them. It's because you learn as we do yes. through, I learn more through rebuke than I do through uh, praise. And um, I learn more from, from failure than I do from success. I learn more from pain than I do from pleasure. I learn more from the, the from the, um, from the, uh, the coffin than I, than I do from, a, from the, from the, uh, from the party. So there are things that we can learn, and but you have to be in a receptive modality. So if you're not willing to receive the truth, that's where it comes down. Remember, we did we did a series on wisdom at the series, the study, and part of wisdom, as you know, is a matter of being willing to actually pursue the truth, no matter where it takes us, um, and uh, means being willing to be corrected as well. One thing I was mentioning about training, I'll show this, uh, this will, I've shown you this before perhaps, but just to use this as an example here. If, if I, we, I, I have the spiritual on the top here. So I say that we're spiritual beings who are embedded in a material world. So the, the, you're, if you're a spiritual agent, but you are also an embodied agent, the point would be then that our natural default would be the visible, the palpable, the material, this what's seen and not what is unseen. But again, here through training, one can train oneself. I think your your capacity for the spiritual is as great as your capacity for the for the uh, visible, for the incarnate, for the incarnation, uh, incarnational life. Because he's made you that way, unlike an angel, you alone are a spiritual being who is embodied. And so, if we are embodied beings, but we're also spiritual beings, wouldn't it follow that in our natural disposition in this world, our natural default will be here? This is why men always are more impressed with with um, nickels and noses with buildings budgets and body count and with uh or another what's the other one the uh the uh abc's attendance buildings and cash we always look for the uh for the quantifiable the big stuff but god says it's not the big numbers that impress me that i'm looking at faithful people who quietly will re re replicate this so you need to train yourself though to realize that this is a true thing, but you're also, this is also true, but you don't have a natural disposition for it, but you have a capacity that God wired you in such a way that you can be conscious of two things simultaneously, the spiritual and the other. But it is not your natural modality in this world, but it is, in fact, a vehicle by which we can train ourselves by actually walking across. So this image here, then, is to symbolize, then, this, let's say a meadow, this is a grassy meadow. I ought to get someone to make a nice image. Uh, a grassy, uh, I, I, maybe I can create some. Um, and you go one time from here and to this, say there's a stand of trees on the other side of the meadow. You go one time and maybe even back, one, but just one time you go there, it'll be no evidence that you, been, you went that way. You go 10 times, maybe a slight little bit, but the time you've gone the same walk, if, if, if obviously you're going from the same pathway 10 times, now 100 times, it becomes a neural pathway. 
that all I, the whole idea of neuroplasticity, that neurons are fire together, wire together. So after a hundred times, it becomes more habituated. A thousand times, it becomes thicker. It's like a there's a and there's a physiological basis for this, as I understand it, in which the myelin sheath gets thicker, gets more extensive, and it's in the nerves. So the sheaths of the nerves actually create a kind of a highway and a and a super highway with it, depending on their use. So the so art when you were training, ten times wouldn't do the wouldn't cut the mustard. You had to do it a lot, a lot, a lot until after a while it became what's the phrase second nature. You didn't have to think about it, and that's what I'm talking about here about the kind of training that is so quote second nature that what you, it gives you the options to do on the on the playing field or on the concert hall, what you could have never done in, without that um, training. It makes it intuitive. In fact, if you're thinking about uh, what are the scales or what are the deep, if you're in golf, if you're thinking about your swing, you're not going to do well. After It is in golf that you habituate a, um, a movement where it becomes so fluid so natural you don't have to think about it instead what you're thinking about is what you want it to do not the, not the way in which you're it's going to happen because that's your intention so then the the club becomes an extension of your being of your of your physicality until it becomes uh an extension um in which you have mind over matter just as we can choose the mystery of mind over matter you can choose to move your arm and it moves well, so it also this becomes an extension never happens without a price tag though and that comes down to a very high price tag indeed who's going to be willing to train themselves in righteousness to pursue the unseen over uh, the the seen, so it's it becomes then um, that whole idea of what is it you seek and are you willing to pay that price? I don't know if this is helpful, but um, yeah, and, uh, helpful. I'm thinking about the flesh profile that you talked about earlier, and I. I what our proclivity is in one area over another. I think that's just critical. Uh, and I, I look at some Christian leaders, have they really sat down and analyzed what their flesh profile was? They may not have gotten in the trouble they did. I think that's right. Um, there, Because there are certain patterns of behavior that are predictable. And if a person does not have accountability or the, uh, you know that that openness to truth or being rebuked, he's not going to... He's likely liable, especially if he's just got a lot of yes men around him. Because yeah. whenever you hear, for example, of a, of a leader, but now let's get more specific to the spiritual side of, of, of spiritual leaders who fall. In every case that I'm aware of, there has been the illusion of accountability, but not the reality. Because accountability is only as good as the information upon which it's based. And you must invite it. And most most do not want to have that that invasive uh, presence. You know, Ken, I'll, I'll just throw a thought out here, and I'm sure that Art understands this better than I do. Um, but I know in tennis we have a saying: that as we coach kids, we say, "If you're thinking, you're losing." Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if you have, oh, because yeah. if you have to think while you perform, you you can't focus on what you should be doing. You're always in a hole. And I'm sure in in flying and stuff is similar something similar to that. I think that's a good word. So if you're having to think about it, then you haven't trained yourself to where it has become fluid, natural. In other words, you it, it's second nature to you uh, to do the thing is uh, you can do a thing because you've done it so many times that there's a fluidity, a natural thing. But it's not. It's it's so what we're saying here is it possible to be to live in a way that's supernaturally <laughs> natural, and so you actually have your new nature, uh, your true self, that be, then so dominates yourself that you become a more intuitively obvious uh, when you're being tempted, and uh, the, the and then the temptations get more subtle, uh, but at the same uh, and instead of the temptation the 
of the the um, the sins of the flesh, it's the sins of the spirit. And the sins of the spirit are much more subtle, as Dante well knew. He, he always put the spirit sins of the spirit in the lower levels of hell, not the sins of the flesh, um, because that's where the pride, which is the animator of all things, comes in. And uh, the the amazing ability for people to to game the system of Christianity and to become celebrities and communicators rather than transparent. Um, a, a word become flesh that manifests the, the living word, the true word, that the, so that they see Christ in you. Instead, um, the, e the emphasis is around a personality or a leader. One of the things that I find impressive uh, and amazing and wonderful about the Asbury revival is that there's no big uh, to do with a leadership. There's nobody who's taking advantage of that. There's a quietness about that. And it's more of a communal context rather than just uh, looking at an individual. So one of the things that I that appeals to me is, and one of the, uh, uh, the, the best sermons are the ones that make leave you impressed with Jesus, not with the presenter. Mm. Yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, just talking about men today, and I guess, uh, or or you know, when we where we are in a lot of places, and that is dealing with uh, apathy. I think the the Christian, especially right now, it, 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 God is talking about a dividing that's going to be happening. We're going to look at and see God pulling us, you know, those away. And he, he talks about that as we as we experience things that we're seeing right now in our nation. But I think one of the great things that we're seeing. Uh, and I know in an area that I struggle, just being honest about it, is is at times just becoming apathetic to to things. Uh, and I don't know if that's discouragement or if I, or if that's just uh, some of the things you've talked about. But if you want to, I just throw that one out to you and how you address that. Yes, I, I, it's very important. If you say apathetic, that's one thing. If you're saying that you're not focusing, I, so it depends on what you mean by that idea of being apathetic. Because when I ask these questions of what do I seek, I don't want you to be apathetic. I want you to be have a very strong desire, a strong um, appetite for something. But in, but instead of being defined by the news or by the things that are surrounding us, it is not apathetic to to realize that that's a sign of the times that I need to be aware of, so that I can be um, a per, an agent of grace in this fallen world. And so this is why this, this whole idea of, uh, you've seen me use this image for many times, that I, yeah, I need to understand the generation I'm in. I need to understand the, the politics. But if I'm defined by politics or by my view, uh, one and, and Satan, by the way, is utterly indifferent as to which extreme you go on. You, you can be you can be uh, crazy right wing and you can be crazy left wing and he doesn't care which it is as long as it's an extreme. Furthermore, he wants us to wring our hands in despair rather than to use this as a reminder that are you surprised? It was a fallen world and in fact we now happen to live in a time that is closer to ancient Rome than ever before, which should be suggestive because in the days before the messiah comes it'll be like that and so even then it was as you well know a crooked and perverse generation surely that defines our times but then for me to wring my hands in despair is not the proper response it's not an apathetic idea but instead in my view uh, C.S. Lewis was right when he said, it's not that those who are, are most heavenly minded do no earthly good. It's just the opposite. It's the people who are most occupied with heaven that want to do the most earthly good because they realize the brevity of the earthbound sojourn and they recognize how powerful uh, the forces are of wickedness in this world. And then they realize we are called to accomplish something that's that um, we have been meant to accomplish. That he's he's actually prepared good works for us that we would walk in them. And those good works is to appear as a light in this world, and to be an agent, not of who's wringing his hands in despair, 
but an agent of grace. Now, that's not apathy. Um, it is attention. It is attention to the things that will last rather than uh, wringing my hands about the things that will not, or trying to create a um, what, you might, what I often call the Camelot syndrome, turning America back into the Camelot that people th thought it might have been. And uh, yes, we, we, it, there were better days when I was growing up. I, I was living in what I think is the most amazing time in human history when I was born. I don't know why I've been graced, graced with that. I'm old enough to remember the 50s. <laughs> it was an amazing time. Uh, there were some bad things as well. We understand that. Uh, and, but at the same time, there was at least a, a, a cultural consensus of morality that has now abandoned, been abandoned. Um, there is a loss of a, of a, of a sense of, of an ethos of, of uh, community, and all these things have diminished. But then the question is, I have to ask myself is, what, am I, what do I seek? What do I want? What do I long for? And so I want to have, I want to be a person who is a man of vision. And so um, this idea, I've, you've heard me say this, and I'll say it right now again, that most people really are, have anemic desires. So apathy is a killer. You don't want, if you have no uh, apathia, means no passion, no, no, I am saying that we should have more desire, not less, that we should desire so much that we know that the world cannot offer it and fulfill it, so that my desire should be so great that it becomes a zainzuk, a longing, a, a passion, because if I have anemic desires and am not desiring the eternal and the, and, the, and the infinite, it's beneath who I am, you see. So if, I'm, if I desire that more than anything else, what it'll do is actually give me not apathia, but actually a great rich compassion for the things that will last. And then my desires are rightly ordered desires rather than wrongly ordered loves. And aspirate. And so then if I have, so as I say, most people have anemic desires or passions or longings. And as a result, they have sloppy thought lines <laughs> because they don't want something enough to discipline themselves. So they're sloppy in their thoughts and they, they waver. And as a result of their sloppy thought life, they have, as I say, flabby wills. They they haven't trained themselves. So even if they wanted to get out of that uh, out of that um, the 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 the, uh, the kettle, the frog and the frog in the kettle, yeah. um, and, and even if they wanted to jump out, it's so enervated by that time that it can't doesn't have the energy to jump out anymore. It's it's now been defined by the mediocrity of the ambient world. Yeah, and there's a notion notion that people say, "Hey, I'm meeting." I am meeting standards. I am meeting standards. If it's been always my opinion. You're better than that. So quit meeting standards and get get to the highest good. Yeah, don't it don't settle, settle for don't, mediocrity. Yeah, what no. what good is mediocrity? Um, we, we we have not been called to be mediocre. We have been called to greatness. Yes, but in yeah. unique ways, and no two of you will be have the perf the same spirit signature. You see, each of you are called to greatness in the way in which you've been crafted by the one who brought you into being and who <laughs> planned your the days before you, even we before you were born, and had a purpose for you. So the real question is for you to discover the greatness <laughs> to which you've been called as a child of God in your unique sphere of influence. And in your unique gift mix, and in your unique environment, and all those these those things, that's where wisdom comes in. Well, I think following back up on that, I think we're I think we're living in a unique time, and that yes, uh, while you said I think you're I think you're right. We have seen, you know, my father who's 80, uh, 83 now, and uh, a pastor. He's still still working, loves 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 sharing the gospel and, and doing what he does, and mm. and I and I, and I um, you know he. Uh, we talk about this on a regular basis that he that will never see what you just spoke about. The probably the greatest time of America is there, but that's not what God called us 
Mm -hmm. So I call us to, we're also the generation, my generation, at least we may be that generation that sees the return of Christ. Yes. When he's coming back. And so that should excite us. That should, even though we're watching some things that will go down, we're also given the opportunity to see one of the greatest, the greatest event in history that we could ever see, which is the return of Christ. So there's, there's a, an anticipation that I think the Bible talks about. And I think that, that with anticipation comes excitement and it should. Yes, and that's a good word. Uh, there's an anticipation. In fact, now I I look at things that um, I have enjoyed in moments of beauty, and and um, and instead of nostalgia, now I I turn it into anticipation. As hints, what are the best ex- experiences of your life? Instead of just looking at those as things that had happened in the past, I now have come to see them as anticipations. Of, a, of even greater goods in the future. So now I'm being more future defined. So you're defining yourself by the coming of the Lord. So we're defining ourselves by the master, the coming of the king, the coming of the master, or um, are, are being brought to him. Uh, so my my view is that he's going to come for his bride. Um, and and I'm that could that's that's an imminent coming, could come at any time. Wouldn't it be smart for me to live as if this would be the day and every day to live that way? And so I saw I've been granted. So I think you're quite right. You can live with passion and with a, I want to have urgency without anxiety. But it's not my mission to change, uh, to bring society into conformity with the expectations of God. It has never been the mission of the church to transform society. The mission of the of the body of Christ has been to draw people to the to the one uh, who is um, the the Alpha and the Omega to draw them to to that life and to become like Him. So evangelism and edification uh, have always been the the great the great commission is always discipleship, becoming like Jesus. So you become like that to which you aspire. You become conformed by what you long for. What you so what do you love again? I go and so this is my clever way of of giving the full circle. You see, I'm I'm, I'm starting. I'm end. I'm ending up right where I began. <laughs> what do you uh, seek? What do you yes, long for? Yes. 